Visibility, which is going to be covered by Marina. Thank you. All right, so um, my name is Marina Ostazewski. I work in the permit section uh, for a few years now, and I work um, a lot with pathological incinerators, so like crematories, um, emergency engines, compressor engines, and also oil and gas terminals. Uh, yep, thank you. All right, so in this part of the presentation, we are going to be answering the following questions. First, what is a project? And does my project need a permit to install? It is important to answer these questions in order to have a basic understanding of the applicable state and federal rules and regulations for your process or equipment. As mentioned earlier in this workshop, having a permit to install is a legally enforceable document that can include limitations and standards that apply to your facility and dictate the way the equipment can operate. It authorizes your company to build or modify a process as described in your permit application. So let's start with defining another of one of the main terms talked about in this workshop which is a project. A project can be one or more activities happening at your facility. This can include any one of the five terms listed in Rule 201, which we are going to discuss uh, pretty soon. Um, but as it mentions in Rule 278, an activity involves any process or equipment. Therefore, the term project is often used interchangeably with this definition of activity. A new source review or NSR is the type of review the project needs if it involves ins installation, construction, reconstruction, relocation, or modification. NSR is a technical and regulatory review that usually involves a review of air toxics, best available control technology or BACT uh, for VOCs, air dispersion modeling, and other requirements. And there are three different types of new source review. There is prevention of significant deterioration or PSD, uh, non-attainment new source review, and minor source NSR. Uh, so rule 201 states that if you want to install, construct, reconstruct, relocate, or modify your equipment that emits an air contaminant, you need a permit to install first. However, that can be a very broad requirement. And because it is so broad, our rules also include many exemptions from that requirement, which we will be discussing later on. But first, let's define these five terms to better understand what takes place in a project. First of all, we have the definition of installation, which is very straightforward and a common type of application that AQD receives. It involves new emission units going in an existing building or site. An example of this is if you want to add a new engine to join your existing fleet of engines and it will be housed in an existing building. Construction is similar to installation, except everything involved is new. This means the equipment or process is not currently on site and the building or site plan does not exist yet. An example of this is adding a new engine to your existing fleet of engines, but also a whole new building to house it. You would need an approved uh, permit to install for the new engine before you can begin constructing the new building. And this does include activities such as pouring the foundations. Starting construction of any buildings associated with the equipment before receiving an approved permit to install could be a violation of Rule 201. Reconstruction involves existing equipment that is in need of repair. For example, let's say you need to rebuild one of the engines in your fleet. If the fixed capital cost of the new components to have the emission unit operating is greater than 50% of uh, the fixed capital cost required to uh, construct a comparable entirely new emission unit, 
then it would be considered a reconstruction. But regardless of the outcome, it is recommended that you keep documentation of your conclusions to have available for AQD staff upon request. Relocation refers to an admission unit uh, that's moving from one location to a different location at the same facility or site. An example of relocation is moving one of your existing engines from one of the buildings in your facility to a new or existing building on site. It is important to know where the equipment is releasing emissions as it can affect the emission impacts of the surrounding area. This is especially important for equipment that was previously permitted based upon the impact results of air dispersion modeling for certain pollutants or contaminants. Modifications are another common type of application that the AQD receives. It involves changing an emission unit to allow it to operate differently than what the current PTI states. This is because that it changes how the previous technical review was performed. There are several ways to trigger a modification, such as greater potential emissions of any pollutant, emitting new pollutants that were not previously reviewed, and increasing the operating hours or production rate from what is currently allowed. An example of this is to increase the number of hours your existing engines can operate from 500 to 1,000 hours per year. And this is because the emissions from your engine are potentially increasing due to this change. Okay, so now that we have learned all of these terms, let's put our knowledge to the test. Let's say you operate a facility that produces custom steel products. And as part of your process, you operate two coating booths that spray a primer and a top coat. Um, you decide that you would like to add another coating booth in anticipation of an upcoming surge of new product orders. And the new product orders are going to require a new coating to be used in all of your booths. And the new coatings are going to emit different contaminants than your current coatings. You decide that you would like to try out this new coating with the new booth you want to add. And six months after the new booth is added, change the, the two existing booths to use the new coatings. And based on this information, uh, answer the following questions. First of all, what types of activities are involved and with what equipment? And second of all, are these activities considered one or separate projects? Give you a couple of seconds to think about that. Okay, um, so we've had a little bit of time to think about this. Um, so let's find out the answers. So with the first question, what activities are involved and with what equipment? The answer is the installation of the new coding booth and a modification of the existing coding booths. As for the second question, the answer is that it is going to be a single project. So in this example, there are two goals the facility is trying to achieve, increase production and use a new coding. The coding is gonna be occurring in two phases, first with the new booth and later on with the existing booth. We also know the timing of these activities are going to be about six months apart and both of the activities are related to the new product orders. Also, the introduction of the new coding is happening at the same time as installing the new unit. So because of those two key things that I just mentioned, um, it can be argued that both activities would be considered one project. One thing to note though, is that in this example, it, does, it is not necessarily determined whether submitting a permit to install is necessary. That is for the company or a hired consultant to determine what is being emitted and how it relates to the various applicable state and federal requirements. Okay, so now on to construction waivers. So do you need to start a construction before you receive your permit? As mentioned earlier, a PTI is generally required before you can begin construction. However, rule 202 allows for the 
a construction waiver if the project can meet several requirements. And this waiver allows you to begin construction before you have a permit. However, you cannot operate the equipment or process without the permit. The company must accept full responsibility of the risk that comes with a construction waiver. For example, the stack heights built might not be high enough to pass modeling, or maybe the monitoring equipment installed is not sufficient. Modifications to the equipment may be required based upon the application review. The full list, oh, can you go back? Thank you. Uh, the full list of requirements for a waiver are listed in Rule 202, but here are some of the key requirements. So an application must be submitted before or with the request of a construction waiver. The waiver should be sent to the district office, so not to permit staff. And the waiver must demonstrate an undue hardship caused by waiting for a permit to install. Uh, the project cannot be subject to PSD or non-attainment new source review, be construction or reconstruction at a major source of HAPS, or be a construction or reconstruction at a source subject to 40 CFR part 61. If you have questions regarding a construction waiver, please contact your district office. Okay, so we've talked about actions that require a permit to install. There are some reasons though that you may want a permit to install, even though you are not required to get one. For facilities that have the potential emissions to trigger federal regulations, they may choose to have certain enforceable restrictions in order to not trigger additional requirements for their equipment. A permit to install is the usual way to obtain these restrictions. Or perhaps your facility has several permits to install, and over time there have been a series of changes that were individually exempt from the permit requirements, but now your permits don't connect with the actual equipment and operations as well as you would like. A new permit to install application may be the best way to address that situation. You can ask that we consolidate those permits into a new permit so things can line up better. A third situation is where you'd like to change something in your permit. For example, if you have a permit that was issued several years ago and it requires you to monitor process variable A, that choice made sense both to you and the AQD when the permit was first issued. But since then, you've learned that you can get the same or better results with process variable B. And with variable B, it costs less or it is safer for your staff. You can monitor variable B at any time, but your permit still requires you to monitor variable A. You can submit a permit to install application specifically for the purpose of changing that monitoring equipment. Uh, tell us what you would want to change and why it does just as good of a job with the regulation involved. We will review that and if we agree we can make the change and then you can stop uh, monitoring variable A. All of these items have something in common in that they do not require a new source review because the equipment or processes are not being added or modified and the emissions are not increasing. Okay, so there are two main reasons why a permit to install may not be required for some equipment. The first is for grandfathered equipment. The requirement to receive a permit to install took effect on August 15, 1967. If the equipment was installed before that date and it has not been changed since then in a way that would require a permit, it is grandfathered and it does not need a permit to install. Believe it or not, there is still grandfathered equipment still out there, such as storage tanks and boilers, but it is becoming increasingly rare. And then there are the permit to install exemptions found in rules 278 through 291. When determining if your equipment may meet an exemption, it is important to read the entire rule. If you determine an activity is exempt, you are not required to notify the AQD. Instead, keep documentation of your determination and follow all applicable requ requirements in the rules, such as record keeping. A note on Rule 278 is that it is actually an exemption to the use of exemptions. Basically, you should look at Rule 278 whenever considering any exemption within your project. 
this becomes more important as planned equipment gets closer to the maximum allowed uh, size of equipment under an exemption. This rule does not allow a project to consider PTI exemptions if the emissions from the project meet the definition of major source or ma major modification. The definition of major uh, can differ between certain federal regulations, so make sure you are aware of how it is defined in the regulations applicable to your facility. In addition, Rule 278 does not allow the use of exemptions if the actual emissions of any air pollutant from the proposed activity to exceed the significant emission rate for that pollutant. We will take a closer look at significant emissions on the next slide. So to give you some perspective on significant, here are the pollutants that have significant thresholds. You can also find this list on page 3-4 in the workbook and in the front of the PTI exemptions booklet. And a quick note on volatile organic compounds, also called VOCs, include emissions of organic compounds uh, like paint solvents and gasoline fumes. They are regulated mainly because they contribute to the formation of ozone in the atmosphere, which is a criteria pollutant. So the exemptions are always intended to apply to relatively small sources of emissions meaning that they are smaller than the significant thresholds. We mentioned that the exemptions are found at the end of the part two rules. They can also be found in a handy dandy PTI handbook, which can be found pretty easily by Google searching Michigan exemption handbook. Uh, but let's go over two quick examples. So first of all is rule 282D, which is for all residential cooking equipment. That is the stove in your kitchen at home or your barbecue grill. This exemption is a clear example of something that does not make sense to, to be permitted. Even an electric stove has emissions from the cooking process, but the emissions from any residential cooking equipment are tiny. You do not want to have to get a permit from us for that, and we do not want to review a permit application for that either. Uh, the second example that we will go over is for dispensing facilities, um, which mainly refers to gas stations. This is an example of an exemption that perhaps could go either way. Uh, service stations are important sources of pollutants, including toxic air contaminants like benzene, especially in an urban area where there are a lot of people and a lot of gas stations. But this decision was made many years ago. Um, so they are not required to get a permit to install, but they are regulated through different agencies. So there are rules that still apply to them, but they just don't need an air permit to install.